Welcome to Life Devotions, and thank you for joining me today. Jesus Saves Sinners is the title of this devotion. I know that might be one of the most simplest statements that I could make as a title, but dear friends, it is still one of the most profound and most wonderful things to think about, and especially as Christians, it's something that we will for eternity never forget. That does not mean that when we're in heaven that we will have this sense of consciousness of our past failures. No, those will not be remembered anymore, the scripture says. But there will always be this grace of the Lamb of God who we will worship in heaven as we see in Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and, and many other parts that we will worship the Lamb of God who saved us. There will always be that, that power unto salvation by which we acknowledge that we are where we, who we are by the grace of God, that we are partakers of the divine nature because of the incredible goodness and mercy of God. There will always be this divine sensitivity of gratitude. <clears throat> Of, of acknowledging the Lord in such a way and how that all perfectly involved uh, uh, manifests itself. We can look at many scriptures to get an idea, but I don't think we can completely, perfectly comprehend that all until we're in heaven itself. But today I want to just again Oh, let that breath of mercy, that breath of grace breathe upon your tender hearts to say, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was blind, but I see I was lost, but I was found. Oh, friends, let us never, ever, never, ever stop singing his praises for his mercy. Here in Luke chapter 2, verse 11, it says, for there is born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And then in Matthew chapter 1, he also is the same scenario of what's happening in chapter 1 of Matthew, verse 21. And she will, be, and, uh, and she will bring forth a son, and you, Joseph, shall call his name Jesus. That word Jesus means Savior for he will save his people from their sins, plural, not sin, but sins. Yes, he saves us from the nature of sin, but he saves us from our sins, from ways that fall short of the glory of God. That is the word sin. Sin, the word actually means crooked arrow. It fails to hit its target. And, and sin can have a promise of great pleasure and fulfillment, but it will never reward you according to its promise because it doesn't have the power to do so. <coughs> and Jesus came to save us from our sins. When Jesus was walking along the Jordan River with some of his friends and John the Beloved saw him, excuse me, and John the Baptist saw him, it says in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Friends, this is, I still must continuously be filled with the consciousness of this. Why? Because every religion will always be tested in its authenticity, in its confrontation with sin. Because there is no other name given unto man by which we must be saved but the name of Jesus, we read in the book of Acts. His name is exalted above every other name, and at his name, every knee must bow and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Savior anointed is now the Master, the Lord. And Jesus Christ, my friends, is always needing to be revealed to show the authenticity of 
any religion. You see, even within what would be the Christian religion, you can know if Jesus Christ is present in his spirit and power because he is there not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For me, my friends, in being a pastor in this church, Life Church here in Folkestone, and coming to you through these devotions, for me, what's the most important is that you feel his life-giving spirit coming into you, liberating you from the lower nature in your flesh of sin and lifting you out of that lower nature into his heavenly nature where there is no sin, where you enjoy perfect righteousness and peace with the Father. To me, that is the most important thing about these devotions. And all that I can share with you, I pray that the true bread of heaven, Jesus, is in these devotions by the Holy Spirit. And that you say, oh, when I listen to these devotions, I feel the life of the Son of God springing up in me. I feel the love of God coming into me. You see, that's because we share the same spirit, the spirit of life in Christ together. That is for me the most important reason for doing these devotions. Timothy was a pastor of a phenomenal church and Ephesus and Paul was writing his dear friend Timothy two letters 1st Timothy and 2nd Timothy 2nd Timothy is the last of the 13 letters of Paul that we have in the Bible it's the last letter he wrote just before he was beheaded outside of Jerusalem according to tradition and his first Timothy he's writing Timothy and the argument that he was trying to help Timothy is is that Timothy was a pastor with humans, with people. And people in the natural nature like you and me have sin and can act natural and human. And then people would come, traveling ministers, so to speak, would come and they would say, yeah, The reason you still have these problems in your church, Timothy, is because you're not the way you should be. If you really want to be godly, you need to get everybody circumcised, all the men circumcised, because the law says you should be circumcised. And they should keep the Sabbath. And they should keep the feasts. And and this is what all they should do. But you see, salvation is not what we do, but it's what he has done. And these teachers were not sent by Jesus. And they were representing that which was but a shadow and a type in the Old Testament that now is fulfilled in the new through Jesus Christ coming into us by his Holy Spirit. What it foreshadowed in the old is fulfilled in the new through Jesus Christ in us. And, and Timothy really was having a hard time with, yes, Paul, but what do I do with these people's human natures and their behaviors and their attitudes and their arguments and the marriage breakups and and the lusts and the fears and and, and the angers and, and, you know, and, and what do I do? And these preachers are coming and they say, well, it's because I'm not doing this and it's not because I'm doing that. And what do I do? And then Paul, then Paul, who was a true representative of Jesus. Oh, look what he says here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, starting at verse 12. I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man, violently arrogant, But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. And this is a faithful saying, Timothy, and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, 
For this reason I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ may show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So let me just quickly recap a few of this from the Living Bible. He says how true it is and how I long that everyone should know it, that Jesus came into the world to save sinner for sinners, for I was the greatest of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Jesus could use me as an example to show everyone how patient he is with even the worst of sinners so that they too may realize that they can have the life they see in me by faith in him. You see, Paul was saying, look at me. I mean, I was the worst of all sinners, Timothy, and the life you see in me is Jesus. Jesus, Jesus is the Savior of sinners. Jesus came to save sinners. The title of this devotion, Jesus saves sinners. You see, dear friends, none of us can boast ourselves in anything that in the flesh and the Apostle Paul deals with this in Colossians concerning these people that kept on promoting that you have to be circumcised as a man or you have to keep the Sabbath to be true Christians. And Paul deals with this and he says, no, 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 circumcision does not make you a Christian. Christ is what makes you a Christian. Keeping the Sabbath is not what makes you a better Christian. Christ is the only true way to the Father. It is only by Him and through Him that we are able to have fellowship with the Father. He is our Sabbath. Through Him we enter the rest of His heavenly life with the Father. In Him we enter into that rest where we completely come to rest of our own works, of our own, uh, own strivings to be righteous and holy. Now through Him we receive perfect righteousness, peace and joy through the Holy Spirit to live in the rest of communion and fellowship with unbroken communion and fellowship with the Father through His high priestly ministry. No, no. He deals with it in Colossians 2 and in other places. But let me close with you here from the Romans chapter 7, verse 18 and 20. Paul says, I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And then he says in verse 20, sin dwells in me. And so let me close with this thought, friends, because this is something we don't realize. Right now, if you look at Robert Moss' book here in front of you, I have sin right now in this flesh. I have sin in this body of flesh. But sin has no longer dominion over me because I have been baptized. I'm going to speak about this next week into Christ's death. His death is my freedom from sin. And now His death reigns over my sin nature. I have died with Christ to sin, and now I live in the newness of life with Him. The life that you see in this earthen body is not because I am or am not circumcised or because I keep the Sabbath or not, no. Is because Jesus lives in me. Jesus saves sinners. And I, like Paul, can say, yes, I too am a sinner, saved by grace, through faith, and that not of myself, it is a gift of God. Ephesians 2, verse 8. Oh, amazing grace. I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved. I'm no longer a sinner. And John, in his letter, would say it in such a sweet way. He said, the only reason you still keep sinning is because you don't know Jesus. If you would know Jesus, you would stop sinning because he cannot sin. And wherever he lives, he conquers sin. So if you struggle with sin in some way or another, just keep on coming to Jesus and keep saying, Lord, I'm yours. Save me. 
Jesus, I'm yours. Save me. That's a statement David made in Psalm 119. I'm yours. Save me. Just keep coming. Just keep coming. Just keep saying it. I'm yours, Lord, save me. Now I feel that some of you are saying, Pastor, where is it, where is it, where is it? Psalm 119. Oh, I should know immediately where that is, but, um, oh, I'm yours, Lord, save me. How I love that statement, I'm yours, save me. 94, Psalm 119, verse 94, I'm yours, save me. Oh, come on, friends. Trust the Lord Jesus. And his indwelling life is your freedom from sin. His death is your freedom from sin. And now you live in the newness of the life he gives, and he will never, ever fail to be there for you. Amen. Have a good day.